teachers from whom you have received so much. You know, I would still have been an engineer figuring out some kind of fluid dy uh, dynamics or fluid mechanics or food processing had it not been for you uh, showing me the way into the world of communication and more importantly, um, helping me realize my strength in writing and speaking and my knack for it, which is really what brought me into communication to begin with. So thank you so much, ma'am, for everything. Um, what I'm going to do today is we have three different lectures that we're going to cover, but given the time frame that we are going to look at, uh, I'm going to try to condense them all and go through each part in an interconnected way. Before I start though, I like to start my uh, talks by thanking people uh, because in addition to your teachers, there are other people who inspire you theoretically to arrive at the kinds of things that you teach and talk about. So when I talk about communication for social change, that is the broader backdrop within which I will situate uh, post-colonialism, our discussion of neoliberalism and communication activism. I do that uh, paying homage to uh, the many communities and activists um, all over the world and in places like India uh, that struggle uh, to create um, spaces for the use of communication in meaningful ways that offer transformative opportunities. One of the things that I have come to believe about the role of communication is that communication truly holds the key to transforming the world and to making uh, new possibilities happen. So my acknowledgement in this sense is also to the many community collaborators and activists that I have had the opportunity to collaborate with that have um, sort of um, taught me and taught the basic concepts of communication, particularly within the context of questions of colonialism uh, and media. So I'm going to start by talking about um, the processes of colonization. And I begin with uh, this image because we typically don't think of the margins of the globe as our teachers. For me, my greatest teachers have been uh, communities such as this. This is a community that I have uh, collaborated with over the last two decades. Um, it's uh, uh, villages of Santalis in the eastern uh, parts of India. And uh, their worldview, their ways of living the world, uh, negotiating communication have taught me some of the fundamental lessons of the ways in which communication colonizes, uh, the ways in which communication works toward reproducing an imperial structure, but also then what are the transformative uh, possibilities with communication. Particularly important, as you see in this image, is what I recognize as the ability of those at the margins to use communication meaningfully. <coughs> so I hope through the lessons in these uh, three lectures, one of the takeaway points that you walk away with is this idea that those at the margins are not passive recipients of mediated messages that are disseminated to them, but they are active creators of imagination. More importantly, for the problems that we face in the world today, you think about climate change, you think about global inequalities, I think many of the lessons for us have to come from the communities at the margins that have been systematically disenfranchised. And I will give you an example to situate this context. One of the earliest pieces I wrote um, on a Santali theory of communication talked about this idea of spirits living in trees, okay? And how when you cut down trees, these spirits enter from the trees into the human body. And that entering of the spirit into the human body disrupts the ecosystem and the balance of the ecosystem. Now that basic principle forms the basis for many indigenous movements across the world on forest rights, the protection of the environment, and the protection of the natural resources. Unfortunately, the ways in which imperial structures have worked globally, they have taught us to not believe in these stories. 
because they have only taught us to value particular forms of knowing. And as Franz Fanon would say in Black Skin, White Masks, uh, those of us that are colonized peoples, we have fundamentally been trained to discredit these ways of learning and knowledge and rather reproducing the white man's way of knowing, but also more importantly, the white man's epistemic tools and structures. So what counts as knowledge is fundamentally tied to the imperial and colonial structures which continue to be reproduced. So even today, as we talk, for instance, in UNESCO about the recognition of intangible cultural heritage, and you will find India present there in those conversations in terms of saving the loom and saving local handicrafts and all that. In that very backdrop, you have indigenous communities across eastern India that are obliterated from their sites of livelihood because they happen to sit on mineral resources that could be mined, that could lead to so-called ideas of development without having an opportunity for participation and voice. And when indigenous communities do participate, they are framed as Maoist in the media discourse. And that discourse then legitimizes various forms of state oppression and violence. So to me, what I would argue in this talk today, that fundamentally is the form of colonialism that we inhabit. So to imagine social change and mediated activism is to fundamentally undo the epistemic structures that we live amidst and that we reside in, in terms of thinking through the role of communication and imagining communication. So in part one of the lectures, I will cover post-coloniality and post-colonial logics. In doing so, I will look at the spatio-temporal logics of media, the ways in which space and time are constituted and constitutive of logics of media. Then I will look at the ways in which communication is conceptualized within colonial formations and the relationships between colonialism and capitalism. And I will argue that this is a fundamental Marxist argument that to the extent that colonialism is a tool of capital, you cannot talk about decolonization without interrogating the fundamental logics of capital and capitalism. So in that sense, it is not decolonization when you talk, for instance, about how do Indians consume um, mainstream media or transnational media. You have an Indian narrative in that, but that is de not decolonization because it continues to reproduce the colonial logic of capital. So I will differentiate between post and de, meaning what is post-colonialism and what is decolonization. And I will suggest that these are two fundamentally different concepts that we need to be attentive to. Particularly situating myself within the context of Asia, having worked in Singapore over the last six years, having worked within Chinese contexts um, over the last six years, I also think we need to be careful of the term the Asian turn or Asia centrism or movement toward Asia. And my caution is that to the extent that this Asian turn, be it the Indian turn or the Chinese turn, reproduces the capitalist colonial ideology, it is not really an Asian turn per se. It is simply a reproduction of the Eurocentric turn with an Asian face. That will be the argument that I will offer you. This will then be the basis for me moving into section two which will be about neoliberal media formations. How do media formations sell the agendas of global capital and privatization? How is the logic of privatization um, reproduced as the uh, normalized logic for the organizing of post-colonial societies? What are the kinds of ideological tools that are used for capitalist extraction? but also for continual displacement of the people like the Santalis or the Dongria Khons from their spaces of livelihood. And then how are mediatized spaces consolidatized, right? So how do media spaces actually work to enable the agendas of global capital? Part three then, um, I think of myself as, as uh, uh, Professor Roy was saying, I am a performer as well. I do a lot of uh, writing in terms of op-eds, but I produce documentaries, I produce advocacy campaigns, and collaborate with activists in doing that. So I think that for me, 
theorizing is not enough. So I would have done my job at the half point if I stopped at critiquing. So I will draw from my lessons of activism then to talk about how media can serve as sites of activism and global transformation and how can we actually imagine other possibilities and decolonial possibilities working through questions of the medium. So I will begin by offering a historiography of media objects and in this sense I perhaps will be building on the, some of your uh, lecture because I looked at your topics and I hope that I am complementing what you have already learned. I will first argue that colonialism is a mediatized project. What do I mean by that? That the very notion of colonial expansion is mediatized through communication technologies. All the way from the railways, for instance, which served to spread colonialism. But what with colonialism? The railways also served to spread the reach of global capital and the extractive tools of global capital because the railways were fundamentally built so that extractive resources could be brought in and then could be channeled to uh, the empire. So in that sense, if you think about the railway system as a mediatizing tool, in a similar way, capital needs mediatizing tools in order for its colonial project to be carried out. So media as objects are tied fundamentally to colonial logics. This of course also goes back to the decades of US interventionism across the globe. So when you think about uh, the US Agency for International Development in its earliest forms of post-Cold War expansion projects in uh, Indonesia, in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, they used media tools and media programmings in order to disseminate ideas of the market, ideas of capital, which were packaged in with notions of development, health, uh, empowerment, uh, reproductive participation. So inherent in this was an idea that the subject, the colonial subject as a targeted subject, would find liberation through their participation in the market. So if you think about some of the earliest examples, and I've written about these uh, programs like Humlog. I don't know how many of you remember Humlog. Humlog was a collaboration between um, USAID and then Doordarshan and uh, Population Communication International. So Humlog to us as viewers comes across as a contested space for negotiating gender and identity, introducing narratives of empowerment within the context of the mediatized spaces of Doordarshan. But if you look at what was going on in the backdrop, Humlog was driven by a colonial logic of using population control um, as a tool for disseminating ideas of development. So if you think about and look at the documents of Population Communication International, which I've done in uh, quite a bit of my work, what you find is that they had a very simple logic in terms of the goal for global population control. And it was that the growing populations of the global south were perceived as a threat to US geosecurity. Yeah? And these growing populations of the South were also the parts of the world that were aligned to, uh, so the US perceived, to the communist agenda. Much of the third world in the Cold War US logic was aligning to or moving uh, to the communist agenda. So part of then defeating the communist agenda was to disseminate the idea of population control. But along with that, was the idea of participation in the free market and tools of the free market as sources of emancipation. So what else did Humlog introduce? It introduced the notions of family planning and population control, but it also introduced something else. And I don't know, you know, I am sort of of that generation, so I remember this clearly. It also introduced Maggie Two Minute Noodles. It sounds pretty innocuous, Maggie Two Minute Noodles, but what was the sort of transformative moment at that point. It introduced the concept of advertising driven programming and advertising that supported programming, but also advertising that introduced ideas such as convenience food as marketable commodities 
connected to notions of empowerment. So you have empowerment then as a tool that is being offered as a solution to Global South, pretty much embedded within a colonial logic. Now this logic though, continues to be reproduced today. Today you, for instance, have uh, Priyanka Chopra talking about save the girl child on NDTV while standing on the platform of Vedanta, which is a transnational mining corporation that is displacing indigenous communities from their spaces of livelihood. So you have to, as communication scholars, interrogate these floating signifiers such as empowerment, equity, and really ask the questions, whose empowerment, whom does it serve, and with what kinds of agendas. And I will put forth the argument that these media objects fundamentally serve colonial logics. So <clears throat> colonial expansion in this sense feeds the expansion of global capital to the extent that um, uh, colonizers find new territories, those become new sources of raw materials, those also become sources of unpaid or bonded labor. So if you think about the history of slavery with capital, what you see is that slavery fed capital, just as uh, the loot, uh, the colonial project, like loot now, it's a, a Hindi word that enters the English lexicon with a fundamental idea that looting a country is basically tied to the expansion of capital and the ability of capital to innovate and intervene. And within that context also you see the creation of new market opportunities. So I have systematically looked at documents of the USAID, particularly with a variety of programs that are about empowerment of communities. So if you look at the internal documents of the USAID that are presented to the US Senate, uh, if you look at the internal documents of the USAID that justify the legitimacy of USAID to the uh, funding agencies, what you see is that that's where USAID talks about how these projects of empowerment actually enable new market opportunities for American uh, corporations, new branding opportunities for American products and commodities. So industrialization in this sense is tied to the extraction of material resources, to slave trade and occupation of territories. So if you think about uh, the currently occupied territories of Gaza and Palestine, uh, that particular settler colonialism and occupation is also a site for capitalist extraction. But today the face of that capitalist exp expansion has changed a little bit. So now you have the Adanis uh, expanding into indigenous communities in Australia. That is what I say capitalism with the Asian face. And of course supported by the Modi government with various forms of illegal uh, funds transfers. Similarly, if you have China uh, in Africa, right, we talk about China Africa. What is the presence of China in Africa, but fundamentally a colonial project carried out in the name of development? So this is now the white colonizer is the brown and the yellow colonizer that is reproducing the fundamentally the same logics. You know, very close in Southeast Asia where in, I was in Singapore, if you look at the regions of Cambodia, and you know the reinvention of the silk uh, uh, route and the imaginary of the silk route that imaginary is projected as a south south imaginary you know china coming in with pakistan and collaborating and creating such a feel good kumbaya win win situation but fundamentally if you actually look at physically the spaces you see communities being displaced from their sites of livelihood in order to make uh, a way for this huge developmentalist project. But you also have to fundamentally ask who benefits and who profits from these projects. And again, the idea is that these projects become tools for the expansion of now Chinese capital, which again is intertwined with and not disconnected from US capital and Indian capital. So that's the point that we have to remember that the Asian turn it's not fundamentally, there is nothing Asian about it in that sense, but rather it is an expansion of this new colonial logic, of course, with new sites of investment. So the knowledge of and on the media are tied to these colonial uh, logics. And what do I mean by that? That the media serve as key instruments 
for the dissemination of these logics. So if you think about it within the context of development and just preparing for this talk, I went back and looked at the ways in which um, indigenous struggles in India are framed in uh, dominant or elite Indian media. And unfortunately, or fortunately for my case of making the point, what you see is that it's the same colonial logic. So the indigenous people resisting are the Maoists, they are the terrorists that are in the way of development, they are obstructing the pathway of development and therefore need to be dealt with through state and military violence. So this is an interesting point because we talk today within the context of the rise of the Hindutva nation of the reworking of culture, right? Culture has become such an important site and we are talking about how in the days of the uh, Ramayana or Mahabharata, you know, um, rockets used to fly and internet had already been invented and all that. But really what is also going on in that backdrop are the actual sites of culture as participation are being erased, are being displaced and often through the deployment of state, military, police violence, justified through the framing of communities as threats, right? So this is again the same old colonial logic in a sense that to the extent that this colonial logic and the empire was resisted, how was it addressed? Think about it. Through the framing of the other that challenged this colonial logic as terror, right? As something then that needed to be controlled uh, through violence. So within the context of global democracies, I think when we think about the question of media objects, we have to also interrogate the ways in which these media objects are aligned with the violence that is integral to colonial expansion and capitalist expansion. And finally, I will argue that the organizing logics of media re studies reproduce the colonial ideology. And I would say, and I would make the argument that sometimes even within post-colonial studies, when we seemingly interrogate these media objects, we continue to uh, reproduce these organizing logics of media studies. How so? Let me give you an example. Let's go back to this image. So this is actually a place not too far from here. It's a place called Bel Pahari uh, in the Jharvram area. This was, if you think about most recent history of India between 2008 and 2012, uh, site of what is called now one of the strongest Maoist uh, resistance. Again, what gets framed as Maoist resistance, right? Um, uh, rather than talking about indigenous resistance or the ways in which indigenous communities re uh, uh, responded. But in this particular village, there isn't the preponderance of the dishes and the media reception tools that we think about when we project the global dissemination of media. What do I mean by that? You do not see, when you ask villagers what do you do in your leisure time, they still spend their time playing the drums, dancing, and often drinking haria, which is the uh, desi liquor uh, that they uh, produce. They do not sit and watch TV and watch programs in front of a televised screen. Post-colonial media studies, with its obsession with mediatizing objects, erase communities such as these from sites of articulation by not recognizing the communicative and mediatizing processes that communities like these go through in articulating their voices. So one of the things that you see in the backdrop of this resistance that happened is that drums and conscious, what we call shark, uh, these were the primary tools through which um, um, communities communicated with one another. So, you know, when they were going to go out to protest, and I've seen this, I've done um, interviews post the Maoist conflict since 2012, and one of the things that they will talk about is, you know, how did you talk about the movement or how do you actually get people to be recruited into the movement? They say, oh, you know, we use the drums and the uh, uh, conscious and we blew the conscious. And when the conscious were blown, you knew that that was the time to come out 
and to join and to join in the streets and then you will see these large pools of people coming out on the roads going to the police station and carrying it so that very idea also then dislodges our notion of what we think about as media objects or mediatizing objects so i invite you to think beyond the ideology of the mobile phone as the liberating object because that is now the new ideology right so um intel is going to come in or uh, um the next global uh, uh, telecom corporation is going to come in give mobile phones and shanties of bombay and then um, voila people are going to be empowered right we have to interrogate that logic but may i also suggest we have to interrogate our own complicity in our logic you know what really troubles me is that we often produce the kinds of students that go out and actually reproduce the same logics in carrying out new projects of global capital so let's go back to a little bit of tracking the history of communication as a process within this sense and you will see how this is fundamentally a colonizing uh, history so it starts with modernization theory of rusto you know that talks about the stages of change model right so what is the stages of change model how does a primitive society become modern it becomes modern through tools of communication and media yes so tools of communication teach people habits of democracy habits of capital teaching them how to participate in the market and through that process societies become modernized this very racist and colonialist history is the fundamental infrastructure of communication so the institute of communications research with wilbur schram later uh, daniel learner uh, everett rogers who carried out many of the development projects in india as a consultant continue to reproduce that logic so if you think about the insat uh, satellite radio projects uh, with community radio these very early projects in india fundamentally came from that colonialist logic which is what for instance villagers and rural people they are uneducated they are illiterate so who will come to save them people like you and me right who are the brown skin white masks right so we have been trained by our colonial masters and now we can come in and give them some educational programs on radio or tv and boom you know they will be saved poverty will be, the landscape of poverty will be changed and people will be moved out of poverty this simplistic logic was the very logic of communication as a discipline so transformations in the globe then when we think about them as communicative transformations are produced through the ability of communication to persuade so here i will offer a, a thesis statement that the very idea that communication can persuade is a colonial idea why because it begins with the belief if you think about the basic knowledge attitude behavior model or what we call the kab model and i'm just amazed that when i look at many indian curriculum how so much of the kab model is reproduced in these curriculum in terms of what we are teaching our students right so it's the magic bullet <coughs> or the hypodermic needle you put communication into that needle and to the extent that communication is designed strategically you have done your audience research you will inject it into your target audience and they will be transformed and all of a sudden the poor will realize oh my gosh my ways of living were pretty backward and now i need to get on with life i can go and buy uh, some maggi in the market i can go buy some kama sutra condoms and participate in family planning and boom i will be moving out of poverty right but part of this and i want to make the argument what post colonial studies misses out on in the criticism of whiteness or eurocentrism is the complicity of the brown skins and the elites from post colonial societies in reproducing this logic we benefit as the bourgeois as the middle classes by reproducing this logic we get money in our pockets you know i'm often amazed at how um, many times i've met these wharton princeton harvard type mbas that are somewhere in bangladesh or somewhere in uh, papua new guinea uh, helping people and saving them right coming from our post colonial societies making huge bucks for doing it so social change now is a big industry for profiting 
uh, while having no idea of the communities, their contexts, and their lives. So, as post colonial scholars, we need to be particularly critical of our own complicity. So, if one of the things that I take away from this is how am I participating in the reproduction of global capital? How am I participating in the reproduction of the imaginary of capital by reproducing this idea of communication as persuasion? And then this goes on then to the idea of communication technology. So these were, if you think about the earliest projects of USAID in the Middle East, in South America, and in Asia, it was all about bringing in communication technologies or what would be called technology transfer. So if you think about the INSAT project, this is a good example of this, uh, creating the radio, the satellite, uh, the digital as tools or as infrastructures that would lead people to be emancipated. Now you see this being reproduced even uh, today with sort of the idea of the Facebook revolution, for instance. So what do you need with the Arab Spring? And what is the big narrative in media studies of the Arab Spring? That Facebook came into Egypt and it liberated the people of Egypt by giving them access to freedom. Uh, which is actually a simplistic and colonialist narrative because it ignores the work of the labor unions, the trade union movement uh, of subaltern resistance in Egypt that formed the hotbed or the catalyst for the transformation. But it also creates a new market opportunity, you see. So now Facebook can come in and bring in revolutions the world over. So you have now a new market for Facebook and uh, the National Endowment for the Democracies in the US, which is an organization that is a project of the empire, does things like training programs working with Google and Microsoft and Facebook, training communities on how to be activists. Yeah, and when you look closely at the documents about how to be activists, it is also about creating new markets for these transnational corporations of media. And it's important to be critical of that. So this is the classic then diffusion of innovations curve in which we think about the role of the media, right? So here you have any community that you can think of and they are introduced to new communication technologies and they move through early innovators and adopters adopting the technology to early majority, late majority and laggards. So it's a, a bell-shaped curve, right? How is this bell-shaped curve also a colonialist logic? Because you think about the depictions or the symbolisms in these curves. The people who are late majority and laggards, what are they? They are the traditional people. They are the primitives. They have, are the ones that have not adopted your BT cotton, uh, your biotechnology seeds, um, your mining agenda. You know, they are the ones that are saying, OK, I'm going to resist. So they are the backward people. What is communication going to do here? They are going to work with the innovators. This is the farmer that's going to say, hey, I'm going to take BT. right? and actually work with them in order to disseminate the technology. So I think about this in the context of the development project in India, for instance, and how the role of communication is thought of. It is often thought of in terms of how do we get to the late majority and laggards. So it is about how do we use tools of communication to bring social change, but also social change that serves empire. So if you think about the logic of BT, that is not a neutral logic. BT is also about the privatization of the seed and creation of market monopolies that serve transnational seed corporations, i.e. Monsanto. Yeah? So the role of development as communication is also about creating new markets for transnational agri-capital within that context. So the overarching assumptions, and I wanted to throw in this image as an image for you to look at, because this is the kind of image we celebrate in post-colonial studies and we say, oh, look at it. This is hybridity and cosmopolitanism. And even in these rural areas, you can see people watching MTV. That too is a colonizing logic. And I will sort of work through that in terms of demonstrating this. So within that logic is the idea that MTV is a resource and a carrier for change. We don't ask what kind of change, whose agenda of change, and how are these agendas of change related to agendas of global capital? The reactionary response to this then is what? Your Bajrang Dal and Hindutva activists coming down and say, oh, we will break down MTV. 
But both of these, and I want you to attend to that, are complicit in the logic of global capital. Because they work with the logic that these mediatizing technologies are the carriers of change imaginaries. So technologies in this sense are always positive, creating positive effects. So if you think about the examples of a mobile phone, or you know, uh, Professor Roy talked about Sundar, so I will give you a Google idea, right? Which is the Google balloon bringing internet to uh, rural communities. What is the idea beneath that? That once you can connect these rural communities to the internet, they will be transformed, right? Or once you connect uh, children in slums to multimedia kiosks and give them access to a kiosk, they will learn. And through that learning process, they will develop and they will walk out of poverty. The thing to remember, and you know, I was trained as a social scientist, so I ask about the question of evidence. So a lot of these conclusions I come to are through questions of asking where is the evidence. So do people actually that are targeted through these programs walk out of poverty? What do uh, communities of children in low-income communities and communities of poverty, when given access to a mobile device, do with the device? What kinds of behaviors and functions do they engage in? And most empirical studies suggest that when you create these communication tools, rather than being these positive enabling changes, they often become tools for downloading music, downloading entertainment, chit-chatting with each other, uh, sharing uh, gossip with each other, rather than being the instrumentalist positive tools for positive knowledge gaining and transformation. So this idea that development benefits will trickle down once you bring a new technology is a hoax. Yeah? It is not borne out by evidence. And I will sort of articulate this within the context of thinking about the imaginary of the Green Revolution, for instance, and look at the case study of Punjab. You have uh, series of ethnographic work that demonstrate that while the Green Revolution did indeed contribute to high yields, so if you look at the overarching pattern, the yields were very high, yeah? and that actually did happen. But if you look at what happened in terms of distribution of resources, what happened to poor farmers, what happened to access to livelihoods among poor farmers, what happened to the drug problem in Punjab within the context of the uh, Green Revolution. They bring in other kinds of pictures in terms of the socio-cultural fabric of a community and how that actually is disrupted within the context of uh, technologies. So we have to interrogate this idea that technologies trickle down. Because in most instances, what the literature and what the evidence tells us is that any technology are most likely to be adopted for their benefit by the rich or by the um, upper classes or by those that have already access to forms of education and information. So if you think about the knowledge gap hypothesis, right? what does knowledge gap hypothesis say? That the introduction of any communication intervention and technology into a community is going to increase the gap between the haves and have-nots. So over a period of time, the gap is going to increase rather than reduce in terms of what happens with the use of technology, but also with the development project. So clearly, trickle-down benefits do not trickle down. And this we see with empirical evidence, for instance, with global inequality and poverty. If trickle-down uh, benefits did indeed trickle down, we would have solved the problem of poverty. But we are in the midst of some unprecedented global inequality in the world today, driven by this trickle-down logic. So innovations, we argue, mark the difference between primitiveness and modernization. And I will show you some excerpts to sort of demonstrate the ways in which this also plays out the idea of race. Because the racialized body of the primitive other becomes the subject of the intervention. But not only does this happen within the context of Eurocentrism and the hegemony of whiteness, but this also happens within post-colonial context. So if you think about an upper caste Brahminical uh, ideology being the site that creates the difference, it is the body of the Dalit, the underclasses that become the targeted bodies that become the sites of interventions. Um, 
Modernization is the ultimate goal state of humanity, but modernization within a particular logic. So what kind of modernization? Modernization that is embedded in the logics of technology driving global capital. So to give you one example of this logic, I want to go back to this Daniel Lerner quote. That was part of my graduate school reading, right? It's part of uh, a text called The Passing of Traditional Society. A learner published this in 1968, of course, at the peak of the empire, right? And uh, the Cold War project. So you have to think about that context when you're reading this quote. And when you say that, oh, learner was a racist, you also have to think about the ideology that this reflects rather than thinking about the person per se. So here he says, <coughs> Millions throughout the Middle East are yearning to trade in their old lives for such newer ways than what modernization promises to most people. The Western model of modernization exhibits certain components and sequences whose relevance today is global. Everywhere, for example, increasing urbanization has tended to raise literacy. Rising literacy has tended to increase media exposure. Increasing media exposure has gone with wider economic participation, which is per capita income, and political participation, which is voting. Now, this is the ideology of global capital, which is what? That to bring democracy into the world, what do we need? Capital. We need access to the market. You give people access to the market, you would have created democratic opportunities. The point is that secular process of social change, which brought modernization to the Western world, has more than antiquarian relevance to today's problems of the Middle Eastern tradition. Indeed, the lesson is that Middle Eastern modernizers would do well to study the historical sequence of Western growth. But this is the same model that was also targeted to a coterie of the Indian elite, that for Indians to study this model, the Rastovian model, right? which is the uh, stages of change model of growth. To study this model would be the way in which you would develop your own societies. So inherent in this, of course, is the missionary idea of lifting the burden of the soul, right? So the soul is backward and downtrodden and can be uplifted through the role of communicators as the change agents. But you know, here's the thing, right? Again, you think about your own curricula and think how we reproduce the same idea when we are teaching our students. So you will become the new missionaries in the post-colonial world and you will come and change these people. So here you have image of the Middle East in development. So what is the Middle East in development? People riding on camels. Yeah. And what is that stage of development then? That image where I saw that they would be using Facebook or sitting in front of the TV screen and getting the mantra of democracy. Uh, similarly, image of Africa in development, what do you have? Uh, a series of black bodies that have their arms stretched up to the messiah of development and saying, thank you, Lord, for giving us the beauty of development. Yeah? But here's the thing, right? Imagine how this same logic is re-articulated in post-colonial contexts. So if you turn on your screen of, you don't have to be Republic TV, right? Let's even take the mainstream ones like NDTV. Yeah? And you look at the logics in which the rural, the indigenous appear in mainstream media narratives. And it is through the reproduction of the same ideology of recipients of arms of development that will be saved by these tools of uh, development. So development becomes possible through technologies for societal transformation. So introduce uh, mobile media, so in the contemporary context, introduce mobile media tools in the global south, and those would transform southern societies. There are grants given all the way from Gates Foundation uh, to Clinton Foundation to uh, the Ford Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation, which are, by the way, all private uh, uh, foundations with an agenda in privatized uh, transformation, right? to transform these rural societies. So I give this example that is used as an example, a celebrated example. Take the example of Grameen. And we talk about the Grameen Bank as an example where we have brought in new technologies to transform communities. And it too reproduces the same idea, of course now with a Bangladeshi face, with a face of participation, with the same logic though, 
that introducing global capital into the nooks and corners of the global south will bring about this transformation. So role of communication here is a strategic tool. So to the extent that we can plan strategic messages, we can be effective as communicators. So our goal is to persuade. Yeah. So uh, you get paid a lot of money to do this uh, persuasion consulting. You know, um, I remember once being asked, hey, we are doing a project in Bihar on teaching Biharis through a radio program how to participate in family planning. Can you um, come in and join us for a week? And we will give you these many dollars for serving as a consultant. So it's a pretty lucrative market in that sense, this whole market of social change and commodity production. The work of communication is measured in terms of effectiveness. Effectiveness is what? What kinds of effects you can produce in your target audience. So what is your ultimate goal? So if you take the example of Swachh Bharat, what is your ultimate goal? That people would be uh, participating in some kind of behavior change, right? They would be cleaning up. Uh, they would be using toilets and promoting toilets. So these behavior change become the sites for communication interventions. And the changes are all at the individual level. What does that mean? My goal as a communicator is to change you as an individual by changing your beliefs, your attitudes, and in the process, introducing positive behavior in you. So communication becomes a tool for promoting universal values. And what are these universal values once again? Democracy and capitalism. So empowerment as a goal of communication is tied to these two interconnected values, which is democracy achieved through participation in capital. So development in this sense is a linear process, a movement from a state of primitiveness through preparation, through communication, into the state of modernization. Once you have become modernized, you are now a participant in democracy through the tools of capital. Yeah? So in that sense, to the extent that I have given you some communication tools and technologies, I have enabled your movement from primitiveness into a state of modernization. So the role of communication, and I use the example of smart cities, and I want you to think about the example of smart cities. Because the argument I will make is uh, the new hoax of smart cities is once again a communicative trope for capital and colonialism, but also with an authoritarian turn. And this is a key point I want you to think through and stay with. Uh, particularly when you think about what is the model of this techno-utopia. I think of Singapore as a model. How many times in your newspapers do you see stories of, oh, Modi wants to build another 100 new Singapores in uh, India? You know? Think about what Singapore is. Yeah, I say this from having worked in, researched in, and theorized through and from Singapore. Singapore is a semi-authoritarian state that uses a variety of tools of surveillance to produce a performance of democracy, while at the same time actually limiting the ways in which you can dissent or you can participate in dissent. So activism is severely limited in Singapore. Advocacy is severely limited in Singapore. If you just look at uh, the most recent examples of what's going on in Singapore, an activist whose name is Jolovan Wom um, uh, was uh, targeted by the state for posting a Facebook post where he said, Singapore courts are not as independent as Malaysian courts. And that's all it needed for the government to go after him and to say that he's uh, in contempt of court. So the reason I say the idea of Singapore as a model we need to be critical of is we need to think about the ways in which communication is deployed precisely to silence protest. You know how you can protest in Singapore, do you all know? You have a designated space. Yeah, it's called the uh, speaker's corner. To go to that space, you need a permit, okay? And you need to first apply for a license to protest. You'll say that on this and this day, I will protest. Then the state needs to look at your application for protest and need to approve it. And then you can show up that designated spot on the designated day. If you're a foreigner, by the way, you cannot show up because you can get arrested. So for all my activism, I have to be very careful about where I'm seen. Because if I don't have a Singapore passport, apparently I cannot protest. So think about the kind of utopia this produces 
in terms of the imaginary of participation. So you can uh, be pretty happy, right? I can feel pretty happy as an expat in Singapore. There are the temples and the mosques and the churches, all pretty syncretic. You get a flavor of Indian culture. You get all the smart technologies, right? So you have artificially intelligent technologies that will detect your face for instance, as a face recognition software, right, that will give you particular uh, kinds of services. But think about the flip side of it. You're always under surveillance. You know, my little son, 10-year-old, will be like, Dad, can I ever get out of being watched by the camera? Because it's always that I'm under the camera. And think about the kinds of effects it produces on the body, on the cell, the tissue, in terms of your ability to imagine and ability to be free in that sense. So when we think about this idea of communication technologies will catalyze growth and catalyze democracies, we also have to think about who has the power. And I think the Facebook example is a really good example when you think about Facebook's involvement in the recent election crisis in the US and Cambridge Analytica, if you have been following it, right? In terms of huge amounts of data being used in order to disrupt democracies, right? huge amounts of data being um, used with the same idea of persuasion in order to target people to produce particular kinds of effects in terms of voting behavior. And you see the entry of that within the Indian context as well. You think about the deployment and the weaponization of social media as a tool for managing uh, elections. And this whole thing of digital campaigns has become the new face of India. So what kind of access are you providing when you participate on Facebook, but also when you have become datafied, when you're the data and I'm the data, right? Because now our bodies, our clicks, our ticks, our likes, you know, I was saying that I post on Facebook, I participate a lot in Facebook, but then I also think that I'm constantly with my likes and shares and sharing of emotion and affect becoming a tool that has been colonized within that logic and within that larger project that Facebook can use to sell for various kinds of purposes. Now think about the consequences of this when these data are sold to authoritarian regimes that have now control over your behaviors and want to produce particular kind of behavioral effects. There is a whole industry called the nudge industry. I don't know if you have heard of nudge. This is the new uh, trend in communication, right? Nudge economics. So uh, the US government during Obama time uh, invested in uh, nudge economics, so did UK. Now Singapore uh, invests in this in terms of behavioral economies. And what is the idea of nudge? That we can harness your data, your behavioral data, and then give you access to particular kinds of communication design solutions that will transform your behavior and produce the kinds of effects that I desire to produce in you. So this idea that communication promotes market and civil society, you also have to wonder what kind of civil society and what kind of market. And really whether these civil societies are spaces where democracies thrive or whether democracies are actually limited by virtue of state control over these technologies. So I will, I'm paying attention to time. I want to take till 11.15 and then take a 15 minute break if that is okay, yeah? So I will uh, take the next five to seven minutes to wrap up this section. Then we can have a little bit of discussion. I would like to hear your responses and then let's go on break. Yeah. So I want to end this section by differentiating between what I call post-colonial and decolonial. So the idea of the post interrogates and attend to the binaries that are constituted in and circulated by the media. So if you think about uh, the originary ideas of post-colonial theory, from Edward Said, right, where Said actually starts talking about the binaries and the ways in which the East-West binaries are produced into structures of knowledge. A lot of excellent media studies have come out of this tradition to interrogate these binaries. So if you look at the special issue of communication theory, the journal that introduced post-colonial theory, it has a series of articles that talk about the media formations across various parts of post-colonial societies to demonstrate and to interrogate this idea that media consumption is not simply a Western artifact, that many post-colonial societies 
consume media, but in their process of consumption, they produce these hybrid identities that negotiate their own post-colonial identities as well as the logics of cultural flow. So it depicts the interplays between the local and the colonial. That's where post-colonial scholarship is at its most powerful. So there is this article that by my colleague and friend Radhika Parameshwaran who talks about how the National Geographic uh, projects particular images of the Global South. Yeah? But also how those images then are taken up by people of the Global South to challenge uh, these ideas of the Global South. Right? So you can, for instance, have in the context of India, the juxtaposition of the notions of tradition amid notions of modernity. You can consume your ideas of um, how to plan and arrange marriage through Facebook. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of the juxtaposition of the post with the colonial and the ways in which that create hybrid opportunities. So agentic negotiations are key, right, in post-colonial studies, that in post-colonial societies, how is agency enacted in negotiating these various sites of symbols, identity formations, and identity processes. So we can look at hybrid media practices um, on which Daya has written a lot about, particularly in terms of thinking about how then various media formations themselves become hybrid entities. So you can think of even um, news uh, reporting sites within the context of post-colonial societies and the ways in which they depict different tensions. They depict the tensions that emerge out of the local context, but situated in relationship with um, these colonial formations of technologies. And then, of course, you have the work of Arjun Nafadurai and then uh, the work of Marwan Kredi, who uh, suggests the notion of cosmopolitan flows. So today, with the uh, imaginary and with the movement of uh, post-colonial subjects, not just in post-colonial uh, spaces, but in the former colonies, right? So in the US, in the UK, you have these post-colonial bodies present. How do these bodies then negotiate as diaspora various forms of identities? And what kinds of features of identities do they produce through these negotiations? So that is critical to examine as well. So in that sense, I would say that the post-colonial project, what it does is it decenters the binaries that are produced in the sort of um, earlier imaginaries that you saw, right? Uh, the kind of learner, imaginary, tradition, modernity. So post-colonial theory has sort of taught us as we look at the work of communication and media studies that these binaries themselves are products of empire, they are constituted within colonial context and they are continually disrupted in the ways in which people in post-colonial societies live their lives. The decolonial project, however, takes a little bit of a different turn and it's important to identify this difference. First of all, I would say that when I think of decolonization, and this is where scholars will differ a little bit, for me, I'm a child of the non-aligned movement, right? So I identify decolonization with Bandung, uh, with the image of uh, Fidel Castro, Indira Gandhi, and Yasser Arafat hugging each other. This is the uh, mid-80s uh, to the uh, mid-90s, just the arrival of neoliberal moment, right? So the non-aligned movement offered a particular kind of imaginary to the globe. And I would say that that was fundamentally decolonizing because if you think about it in a communicative sense, right, it became the site for articulating the idea of the new world information and communication order, which was fundamentally about uh, uh, challenging the global inequalities that you see with the presence of the American empire and the tools of the empire. So if you think about that history a little bit, and this came through UNESCO's uh, advocacy for it. The Envico project was brought down, how? Through the advocacy role of the United States and through its pulling of the funding for UNESCO in a major way, saying that this is too radical, this is too revolutionary, this needs to be killed. In that backdrop, then you have to think about now as UNESCO reimagines itself, it says that, okay, in order to be pragmatic and survive, I cannot have this radical, resistive, transformative project, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to bring in culture. By this point that UNESCO introduces the decade of culture and culture enters into UNESCO, it has been 
defanged of its radical roots. It is no longer resistive. It is about handlooms and textiles and bringing in some indigenous performers to UNESCO to sing and dance um, and about uh, recognizing intangible cultural heritage. But that whole idea that communication is fundamentally radical is no longer there. And so global capital is pretty happy with this idea and it's pretty happy with the new idea of culture as development. So then becomes the decade of culture as development. So going back to the idea of D then we have to think about how to trouble, unmask and resist imperial occupation. We live in times of occupation. Okay. We must recognize that. Let's be told that we have all become post-colonial, right? The colonizing project is done with and we can all celebrate and sing toward a global order. That is clearly not the case if you look at the evidence. Today in the world, we have some of the largest examples of displacement of the have-nots that are produced by the haves. We sit on top of one of the uh, greatest decades of global inequalities that we have seen. So clearly these displacements are continuing to be produced and we need to trouble and unmask these imperial projects. Resistance as transformation of the colonial structure. So I no longer see resistance and you know there is a lot of literature in post-colonial studies that would say okay you, you know you're reading Mills and Boons in India you're resisting. That's just really uh, in some ways I mean I respect that but that's kind of nonsensical and that feeds into the colonial project because it captures that radical site of resistance and turns it into a feel-good uh, agentic expression that supports the dissemination of empire in many ways. Or you're sitting and watching MTV uh, in Singapore and somehow that becomes your resistive articulation. Singapore takes this a notch further even. It says that its new form of authority, its form of authoritarian capitalism is resistance to uh, empire. Uh, uh, so you can see where the whole term resistance then gets taken up to be co-opted and to be co-opted into uh, sites of imperialism. So we have to think about resistance fundamentally in the sense of decolonization which was what? About taking down the empire. It was about fundamentally transforming the existing structure because the structure is unsustainable. So we think about how do we undo actively the knowledge formations that underlie capitalist imperialist expansion and this is where I find a lot of hope in the work of the Santalis or the Dongria Khond who participate with their bodies every day to resist the empire. Yeah, so with the Dongria Khond when they are being displaced from their mountains they are saying that this is unacceptable because this mountain is sacred or when you think about the standing rock resistance with the indigenous communities in uh, North America that are saying that we are not going to take the Dakota XL pipeline and let it come down here and displace us of our sacred ground and we stand in resistance. Those are the resistive imaginaries. So in terms of operationalization, please differentiate between the idea of resistance as a co-opted tool with an empire vis-a-vis -vis resistance as a decolonial project. And you think about our Indian history for me, and you know, being having grown up in Midnapur, right? I mean, I think about Khudiram and Matungini Hajra, as to, or um, the story of Gadar Party. Those are a resistance uh, to me. Not reading MTV in Singapore, right? So, how can we then imagine other possibilities and make another world happen? But to imagine other possibilities, right? We have to decolonize, just like I have to decolonize my own being because my being is a product of that colonial formation. I'm incentivized to participate in the empire. Yeah, I get grants uh, to write in a project for USAID or for the Clinton Foundation to come out and carry out a project. That's easy for me. That is seductive. It is appealing. So I have to think about the ways in which my own selves, and this goes back to Fanon. And I'm so inspired by Fanon, right? Black skin, white mask. How do I participate in my own colonization? and the colonization of my own people. Thank you. So I want to hear some thoughts from you about what we shared. Can we turn off the um, recording? Okay. Do you think the refugee model is the biggest threat for Adivasi people in the global south? I will turn to how Adivasi people articulate 
uh, their uh, imaginations in the in the ways in which I have learned from those movements, right? So, I would say one thing is uh, the self governance, the self sovereignty, and having an opportunity to articulate my voice. I think I think that that is the key side for Adivasi people today. It is a struggle for communication, and how do we have communication infrastructures to tell our stories? So, how do we tell our stories in Bastar, in Chhattisgarh? when the entire state and media machinery are bent upon telling only one particular story. I think that's a real challenge. And what about your views on the national mining policy on 1992? Can you repeat that? On, on what on your views about national mining policy on 1992? I think that, that was a serious threat of the whole global capital should be in a other way. What you tell about so I think that um, if you think about mining policy as such, India uh, is fairly progressive in some ways because India also has the Gram Panchayat Act, which says that you have to have the consultation of communities uh, before you go in with a project. But of course, you know that is constituted in logics of power. So what happens with the Gram Sabha meetings is that those meetings get co-opted, uh, people get bribed or people get held back so that they can't participate in those meetings and then those meetings are declared and performed in particular ways. But I think in terms of the policy space, there is already an intervention possible because there is recognition of voice. So in that sense, I think that India can offer a lot, particularly with indigenous movements and movements that make an argument that there need to be democratic spaces for indigenous participation. You know, and I'm in New Zealand now, I, and I find that as a great example with the Maori, right? They have been able to actually uh, create uh, laws around Maori sovereignty that are well recognized, so that you have to respect the Maori laws before can you can go in and build a mining project or an industrialization project. It's a beautiful question and a very complex one. I don't know if I have an answer uh, to that. Uh, for me, development is uh, the ability of people uh, that are at the global margins to be able to articulate what is meaningful to them and to be able to achieve what they find meaningful. That to me is development. So I will give you an example to elucidate this. Often we portray rural or indigenous communities as backward, right? But in all my work, and I've been doing this work since mid-1990s, right, spending a lot of time in villages in uh, rural India, what I find is that across the board, communities will say, you know, what is one of your main needs? We don't have access to healthcare. That to me doesn't seem backward at all, right? You say we don't have access to doctors, we don't have access to clinics. In fact, in many instances, like in Kharagpur, where you are now, you look at some of the outskirt villages, you get a snake bite even. By the time you get to the state hospital, you're dead. And you say have something like a heart attack or a stroke, you have to go to Calcutta to get proper treatment. And to get proper treatment, you have to sell off your land, your uh, jewelry in order to access that. So going back to your question of development then, how do we ensure that as communities at the global margins articulate what their needs are, that they are able to actually have a say over those needs and able to secure them, you know? Like you th think about the condition of healthcare today in the world, particularly in India, it's, it's commoditized. I mean, we are middle class people, right? And when I think about the health of my family members that, that are in India, I think it's a crapshoot, right? It really depends upon what kind of money you're able to access and where you're able to get to get proper treatment. Otherwise, you might as well be dead. So that to me is development or the lack thereof because of the absence of adequate infrastructures to meet the needs of communities that actually articulate these needs. Or you know, here in Jhargram where it, uh, we talked about the uh, resistance, the Maoist resistance, right? In that backdrop of the resistance, I had written about this even before sort of the movement started saying that people are talking about things like we don't have access to it, schools. Our children want to get, get to schools, they have to walk through these muddy areas 
to get to the school and when they get to the school there is an anganwadi teacher who will just cook things but there is no learning happening over there but these are the things that we hear again and again and we become i think as the bourgeois desensitized to that because if we were not desensitized this would change The which one? The Nazi economy that you said. Nazi. The Nazi economy, yes. So let me take Singapore's examples to give you ideas of Nazi. Um, Singapore has identified that diabetes is a big problem in the country, and it's it's an example really of a smart city because they anticipate problems and develop solutions before they come. So, so a Nazi economy is one where once you decide that diabetes is a problem, you can then figure out. say that people need to eat brown rice as opposed to white rice in order to have greater uh, uh, resistance to diabetes so in order to minimize the risks of diabetes so in a nudge what you will do is you will say okay i'm going to take all my grocery stores right and place the brown rice in the front end of the shelf when people are walking in so that they will see the brown rice that will prompt them to buy the brown rice so this is called economy by design so you are designing stimuli in the environment what you will immediately see what you will not see in order to gently move you in a particular way so in india for instance let's say it it, it also very innocuous right so if you want you to save electricity and turn off the light nudge economy will focus on or the study of nudge will focus on how do we design the light switch and where do we place it so that it will prompt you to turn it off or you can think of another example we want you to eat fruits every day you know there is a lot of research that suggests that if you eat five servings of fruits it will increase your resistance to cancer we want you to eat fruits so a, a nudge uh, design would suggest that we train you where to store your fruit like there's a lot of research that says that if you put your fruit in the refrigerator you're not going to eat it and that's what the people have tendency to do put the fruit in the refrigerator then they don't see it they don't eat it okay so then the question is how do we nudge you to design it such that you would put the fruit right in the table as you walk in and that will prompt you to eat it so the idea is how do we design our environment to produce the kinds of effects that will produce development in that sense right Again, I think it's a great question and an important one, and I will sort of tackle this in my next presentation, where I will talk about um, what worries me today is the sites of global capital as they diffuse as they diffuse into new sites of power in China or in India. Um, they are married to new ideas of authoritarianism or authoritarian control. So part of rewriting of the textbooks is part of that authoritarian reworking of narratives particularly in our disciplines what worries me is t okay so maybe we finish up with this question and then go for t and come back particularly in our disciplines what worries me is the uh, revival of fascism so somehow the turn to china or india is also the return to the hindutva story and the confucian story yeah so in singapore i talk about this in terms of how confucianism is uh, being redone again and again 
to support an authoritarian regime, right? So you say in Confucianism, we all get along and uh, we are all harmonious. So what do you do to produce that harmony? So hey, if you're going to raise your voice, it's disharmonious and we are going to sue you and put you in jail, right? So you, you also have to really be critical of this revival of the past in order to recreate particular ideas of the present that support new ideas of empire and new logics of capital. Because capital is no longer just the US or the European empire, capital is also India and China. So when you ask this question, how much of this is possible, I think it is very possible. And that is why I think it requires vigilance, active resistance, critical thinking, and also a fundamental challenge to the reworking of these narratives to serve authoritarian agendas. Because you see, to the extent that nations can produce these simplistic stories, right? We can produce a Hindutva story. I mean, I'm amazed at how many of my IIT friends, right, are subscribers to the Hindutva ideology. Um, and, and they will feel free to say that on Facebook, for instance, which didn't used to be acceptable when I was in uh, school, you know. Uh, or we'll say uh, uh, things like Nehru was a traitor or uh, Gandhi was a traitor to the nation. And then when you try to engage critically, there is absolutely no critical engagement. Part of that has become possible because of the global structure of media, where you do not ask any critical questions, where it is sort of this flow of affect. So the revival of the past, right, is also a revival of affect. I feel good as an Indian to the extent that I can say uh, that during times of Mahabharata and Ramayana, we flew rockets. It makes me feel good about my identity in a context where identities are so destabilized. Okay, I'll wrap up with that. Oh, thank you.
Negative examples. I got it for the first time. Being technology average. 